Um, they'll be doing a talk on the Banj Jor um, just before uh, Banji starts. Um, Banji, if we can just have a little bit of introduction um, to some of the Seva and your background, um, that'd be helpful. Waigaji ka khalsa, waigaji ki fate. Waigaji ka khalsa, waigaji ki fate. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks for having me um, within um, camp. Within, um, saw the poster. It looks it looks really really good. And hope you guys have all enjoyed it so far. So um, I'm by background, professional background. I'm a clinical psychologist. So I work with um, people, and mostly people from the Sikh community, to try and support them through difficult times in their life, um, whether, uh, whether that's kind of life stress or dealing with the aftermath of bereavement or stress at work, uh, whatever it is, um, a confusion about um, their, their Sikhi, their, their faith, their purpose, um, and so I, I work with kind of young people and uh, kind of adults and, and the elderly as well. And increasingly, I've been working with people who want to bring Sikhi into their healing and their self-development. And um, that's been a very um, as amazing journey for me, um, as well as, as for my clients. And I want to share some of that with, with yourselves today. Um, uh, my, the topic I've been given is the bunch joy. And I laughed when Baji gave me the, the a suggestion for the topic because I, I said to him, you know, I'm really good at, on, you know, I've got a lot of knowledge on that topic because I've got a lot of personal experience with the bunch joy. Um, so, um, you know, I, and I do. <laughs> um, and it's, it's really interesting the way that Gurbani um, talks about the Banjjur and the way that they mislead the mind and take the mind astray. Um, and sometimes not in the most obvious ways. Sometimes it's very um, easy to be caught out by them. And I just wanted to do some bijar on that with yourselves today. Um, and please, you know, I, I really like interactive sessions. I know it's a bit different with it being on audio only, but please feel free to unmute your mics and ask questions or share bijar. Um, I'm by no means an expert in terms of uh, the Sikhi side of things. Um, uh, so it'd be great to hear from your expertise. I'm sure there's lots of people who have lot of got, got a lot of wisdom and uh, also things to share on this topic. Um, so I guess if yeah, everyone's ready, we will just go ahead and start. I'm going to share a presentation. Um, I kind of put this together a little bit last minute. It's got everything I want to be in it, in it, but it might just be in the wrong order. So I will chop and change a little bit as I go through. I hope it's not too confusing, but I'm going to try and share the screen now if I can. So I also want this session to be a bit kind of real and practical because um, I guess personally for a long time, um, I've, I've been, I guess you could say, into Sikhi. I was born into an Amritari family and um, so, you know, from, from a young age, you know, I've had an interest and, in, in, you know, been doing in Kirtan and, and um, reading Gurbani and doing Bach and things. But it was only really in the last kind of few years that I've really, um, there's been a change in how I, Sikhi has been a part of my life in terms of practically changing my character. So for a long time, I was, you know, uh, looked very religious and, um, you know, I did everything that was expected. But I still really, really struggled That's with familiar. my character. Um, and so by that, I mean, I was very grody, really struggled with anger um, and also homme, ego. Uh, and again, those, those things are very big, still, still a big part of me. But it was only re very recently that... Um, that I learnt and was taught how to bring Sikhi into my life in a practical way, way so that I could actually see a change in those elements of, of myself. So I really, really want to kind of share that and be very real today that, you know, um, I, I still really struggle with the bunch of joy every day, every moment of every day. And 
um, it's not an easy, it's not an easy battle. And, and Guru Sahib themselves describes the, um, you know, the interaction between the mind and the Banj Jord as a battle. And, and we'll go into that in a little while. But just to kind of set the scene and just to kind of get a sense of what we're doing all of this for anyway, the, the Sikhi and why we're trying to understand the Banj Jord. Because it comes back to what Guru Sahib tells us is the purpose of our life, which is that, you know, when we came into this human body, we were separated from Akal Purk, Vaheguru Parmeshwar, our true mother and father. And we experienced that Bishoda, another separation. And Guru Sahib and Gurbani tells us that whilst we were in the mother's womb, we received training. We, we were told about this game that was being that had been created by Galpurk and, and Guru Sahib Vaiguru taught us um, they were we were connected to Nam and we were taught what the game was going to look like. We were going to taught that we were we were taught that we were going to go into this human body and that we were going to have to we were going to forget a Galpurk and that we were going to have to remember and, and connect, reconnect back. And so you know, as we're living within this um, this human life, we this blessed opportunity, because it's taken us a long time to get here. And now Guru Sahib tells us the different janams we've had to go through. Gay janam begit patanga, gay janam gajmin kuranga, gay janam panki sarpohoyo, gay janam haver brik joyo, ehe jagdis milan ki bariya. So we've had to go through countless lifetimes to be given this opportunity um, of, of the human human life, um, which is the only life that we can actually reconnect and, and merge back into a Galburg. And this is the purpose. This is our purpose as as Gursiks, as as people, as humans, every human, regardless of faith, regardless of culture, regardless of, you know, creed, whatever, has the same purpose. And because we are not connected to a Galburg, we experience Dukh. Um, so the source of all pain and suffering that we experience whilst we're in this human body is because our live is, is broken from a Galburg, from Vaigru. So because of that separation, because we do not recognize our true mother and father, because we don't really have a, a direct relationship and experience of our true source, we feel separate from God. We feel, we feel separate from our mool, our source. And so because of that separation, we feel pain. Because in this dish, in this what we call Mayada dish, there's lots of pain, it's very turbulent. You know, one minute things are going really good for us, like, you know, we're getting, we're hitting the grades or we're getting the promotion or we're, we found the life partner or, you know, some, you know, all of that seems like it's just going great. And then suddenly something will happen and it brings us crashing down. So this Maya Dadesh, Guru Sahib tells us it is turbulent because, you know, in Gurbani, it, this is complicated, but Guru Sahib created the game as such. So they put what, what Guru Sahib refers to as Gal in charge of Maya. So the game was created at the beginning. At the beginning, there was nothing. There was just such, such, he, such. There was no creation. There were no trees. There were no animals. There were no worlds. There were no solar systems, nothing. And then when Guru Sahib decided to create, Vai Guru decided to create this kill, they created Maya as well. And it was within this um, this Maya, there were two forms of Maya, Sukham and Astul, but it's a bit complicated, but Basically, the, the earth was created as a dharamsala, as like a guest house, and where the travelers, ourselves, our minds, were going to come, and they were going to come for just a few days. Um, in the Guru Sahib talks about it being almost as if it's a few days. It's not a few days, but in terms of it's a very small amount of time compared to how long, you know, the, before that, Vaigru was on their own, it just as such, and we were all part of Vaigru. And then we came into this Maya Dadesh and Vaigru put Gal in charge of this, this Maya. And so what happens is that there's lots of turbulence, you know, there's conflict, 
there's stuff that happens out the blue there might be a bereavement that that causes us a lot of pain and suffering you know we might miss out on a promotion you know we might have difficulties with a life partner all kinds of things happen and when we are not connected with God and the truth of who we are and the truth of this creation then we feel a lot of pain because we don't realize that our time on this earth is, is just kind of temporary and this is not the truth this is we are we ultimately are a God Burk, we are connected but when we don't remember this then we experience a lot of pain so that's why we want to reconnect with the God Burk. that's why we want to achieve our purpose because once we have achieved our purpose and we can experience that whilst we are living then we can experience peace finally you know, we don't have to wait for the next good thing in our life to feel peace. We don't have to wait on, you know, it's when I when I get married, I'll feel peace. Or when I have kids, you know, when I have grandkids or when I get a bigger house. You know, we've got this constant wanting and this desire for more because we have a bit a gaping hole within us, you know, an emptiness that doesn't quite ever get filled. And that's because it can never get filled until we reconnect with our true mother and father. We're like orphans. Um, you know, we have our worldly mother and father, but, you know, imagine being separated from our worldly mother and father as, as children and how painful that is. In the same way, we have been separated from our true mother and father, such Parmesha Agarburg for jugs. So, in, and, and we're experiencing, you know, the suffering as a result. Now, what is it that keeps us from achieving this connection? with the Garburg and merging back into such. Guru Sahib tells us that it's actually the Panjchur. So in this Shabbat, Ek kari dina samoko bahut dehare, man na rahe kaise milo pyare. Guru Sahib is, is saying that, you know, even one moment, even one day is for me too long. That my mind cannot survive. How can I meet my beloved? So again, Guru Sahib is expressing the feeling of, the, of from their heart that they wish to have darshan of their true mother and father, Galburg, from So they've recognized the game. They know that their time within this dunya is, is limited and... Um, that this maya is, is just an illusion. And they've recognized that what they really need is darshan of their true mother and father. And then they ask, is there anybody, any saint, any elevated one that's met a Galburg that can take me back? Who can tell me about my, my true mother and father? I want to meet them. And then Guru Sahib says, Char Peher Chahojuge Samane. The four watches of the day are like four ages. And when night comes, I think it shall ever, never end. So this is obviously somebody who really knows the truth. Because, I mean, if you think about us day to day, you know, it's very rarely that we our thoughts go to a Galburg. It's very rare that our, we, you know, it's usually only at times of Dukh, isn't it? Or, or maybe for some people of, of Sukh as well. But generally, when we're kind of in our day-to-day, -day, busy with our lives, you know, busy with our families, going to work, you know, um, meeting with Rishtadar, all of that stuff, we're doing all of that. And, and we become very, it's, it's very exciting, very enticing to the mind. Um, and so it's very rare for, for somebody to, even in the midst of all of that maya, to have their thoughts going to a Galburg. And, and this is Guru Sahib. Um, you know, whose, whose thoughts are constantly with their true mother and father. And this is where Guru Sahib explains, Panch Dut Mil Biro Vishori. So in Gurbani, the Panch Chor are referred to as Panch Chor and Panch, Panch Dut. Um, and so they have come together, the five demons, the Panch Chor, the Panch Dut, have come together and they are the ones that are separating me from my husband, husband Lord. So Guru Sahib's recognized you know, what the, what the problem is, what the obstacle is. And this is the same obstacle that we are struggling with all the time. So how is it that they, they separate us? 
So <laughs> luckily we don't have to look like this to meet the bunch jaw, or beat the bunch jaw even. But Guru Sahib describes us as wrestler, the mind as a wrestler. Hon gusain da pehlwan lada. Main gurmil uch tumal lada. So these bunch jaw, Guru Sahib actually kind of depicts them as characters, as as things that we, we have to f- kind of fight, you know. The, so just I'll go through the basic definition. Gaam, lust, grod is anger, um, lob is greed, more attachment, and hankar is pride. And so Guru Sahib tells us that the mind, and, and this is the training we received in the mother's womb, and that we can then reconnect with when we read Gurbani. Because that's all of Gurbani is, is training. It's the sants, bhagats, brahmgyanis, who have, um, you know, have gone through this path of life and talked about their obstacles to meeting a Kalpurk. And so that same training that we have already received in the mother's womb, we are able to access again when we read Guru Granth Sahib Ji and really, Koji Banke Parna, like really read to try and understand. So what do these, what do these opponents do? And now what do these Panchur do and how do they keep us separate? So I've got this bit of a silly picture. It was a last minute one. But Guru Sahib describes the mind actually as a king. Anna? So Guru Sahib says, um, Kaya Nagari is Ihman Raja. So the Kaya, the body, Nagari, um, the kingdom of the body. Of the kingdom of the body, the mind is, is the king. The problem is, Guru Sahib explains that the Panjjur, they come together, they've actually been instructed by Kalpur, because remember, everything came from Sach, so even Maya. So at the beginning, when all there was was Sach, and Sach decided that they wanted to create a game, from Sach came Maya. And within Maya, like I explained, is um, is the, the, the Drishman, the visible Maya that we see in terms of this world, the people in it, our possessions, everything that we can experience with these senses. That is all the visible Maya. And then we've got the invisible Maya, which is the Sukha Maya, which is, which is where the Banj come in, these Banj Jor. Because what Gurbani tells us is that the game is created as such that the Banj Jor were placed within the human body. Is Dehi and the Banj Jor Vase. Dehi is body, another word for body. Is Dehi and the Banj Jor Vase. Kaam Krodh Lo Mohankara. Amrita Lutta. Man Muknehi Bujja. So these panchur were put inside the human body and the, the play was enacted such that the mind, which was meant to be a king, who was meant to be the king of the body, the panchur come together and they intoxicate the mind. They trap the mind. So Guru Sahib uses different examples. They say that the, the mind is intoxicated by the panchur. I think I've got a Shabbat here. Here. This is around how, how the bunch short intoxicate the mind. So if you imagine five figures, you can even kind of picture them in your mind, coming together, scheming, and they sit within the body and, and they scheme to try and take our attention away from our true purpose. And they prevent us from connecting to and experiencing Naam. And so in this Shabbat, Kal Kalwali, Kaam Amad, Manua Pivanhar, Krodh Katori Mohopari, so if you imagine that the, you know, if you literally imagine, I wish I could have a picture, but I didn't have didn't take enough time to prepare, but you can imagine a throne and you imagine a king sitting on the throne and the bunch jaws surrounding the king and feeding and, and in, in the same way that, you know, a person gets drunk with alcohol, with wine, and you imagine the bunch jaw giving cup upon cup upon cup of wine um, uh, to, the, to, the, to the king. And what happens to the king? The king becomes intoxicated and wants more and more and more and more and then eventually passes out. And Guru Sahib gives us this analogy because what's happened is all of us who are not connected to Nam, who have not merged into a Kalpurk, are under the influence of these intoxicants that the Panjjur are giving. And we can relate to that, right? You know, anybody, you know, has anybody had the experience when they're angry, when they're really, really angry, that they, they it's almost, it's almost intoxicating. It's almost as if you want more, that you want to just 
let it out and you you know this vindictive part of us comes out and we just you know it's almost it gives us a rush doesn't it and you know you, you can get into that position where you want to you want to be angry you want to be aggressive you know and it's it's the same way with lust as well and you know homme all of these things are very addictive and they really kind of grab onto us and we really feel like you know there's some kind of rush kind of pleasure associated with it although there's a lot of pain afterwards and so you know i, I really like the analogy because what guru sahib is saying that these these bunch draw they come together they feed the mind these intoxicants the king they feed the king the intoxicants and the king falls asleep so our minds are asleep and that is why we don't experience nam and we don't taste amrit ana um is dehi andar panch chor vase kaam krodh lok mohankara amrit lute what do these panch chor steal why are they called thieves because they steal our amrit amrit lute man mukh nahi bujhe but the man mukh doesn't understand koi na sune pukara and nobody can listen to his cries so guru sahib tells us antar kuntha amrit parya so inside us is a well of amrit a sweet nectar that is inside every single human body it's the way that the the, the body is made the subtle body guru sahib talks about and when the panchor come and and do these schemes and they put the mind to sleep the mind doesn't get to experience that amrit that is residing within each and every one of us that is the nourishment for the mind so if you imagine if we think about ourselves if we go a couple of days you know without eating what kind of state are we in <laughs> not a good state you know you get hangry and all that and if you go a few days without you know drinking and all of that because that's a nourishment for the body we need that and that guru sahib tells us that the body needs you know you've got the needs the body has got need for food and in the same way that the body has a need for food the mind has a need for its food ana man ka tosa har naam hai tosa is is sustenance so the, the food the nourishment for the mind is naam and the problem is that we haven't experienced naam for how many jugs that we've been separated from a kalpurk because it's a kalpurk that gives us naam and naam resides within the body is is dehi andar naam nivasi those punch jaw have been with us for lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes intoxicating us intoxicating us intoxicating us causing us to have the same kinds of thoughts and feelings over and over getting us into the same kinds of conflict and sticky situations just so that we don't ever wake up to our true purpose purpose because while whilst the, and we don't the mind doesn't get its nourishment and what is the result of the mind not getting its nourishment if the body withers away without the body's nourishment then the mind also withers away and what is the result of the mind withering away that is when we fall into anxiety when we fall into depression when we fall into conflict with other people when we can't sleep because we are consumed by thoughts and worries when we feel empty and lost and you know some people get to the point where they no longer want to live that happens to the mind when it's not getting its nourishment and who is taking that nourishment from the mind it's the punch jaw so when we can start to understand this game of life that's created that's explained in gurbani and we can read guru granth sahib ji and, and truly try start to understand okay so these are this is this is the problem here the punch jaw you know the anger the the ego the lust the attachment the greed these are the obstacles both from me meeting my true father and mother and also it's the thing that is keeping me in this state of distress so what is what is the sign that the mind is asleep what does guru sahib tell us that that person and and guru sahib refers to them as manmukh and you know when i use the words gurmukh and manmukh i don't refer to the external you know i don't refer to what the person is wearing or what the person you know it's it's about what guru sahib talks about that internal the manmukh that the where, whose mind is asleep and as far as i'm aware that's most of us hana <laughs> that's all of us and except for those rare saints gurmukhs people that have connected to nam all of our minds are asleep 
and what are the telltale signs that the mind are asleep? So let mind is asleep. Let's check in with it with ourselves now. And now let's ask ourselves, is my mind asleep or is it awake? So Guru Sahib tells us, Nano need Paradrishta Vikar. The eyes are asleep. Those eyes are asleep that gaze upon the beauty of another. Sravana Soy Sona Ninda Vichar. Those ears are asleep that listen to slander and enjoy it. Enjoy, when you have, you know, how many, I can speak personal experience, you know, there's a, a bit of a buzz that comes with talking about somebody else, doesn't it? Talking negatively about. That is that, that um, intoxication. Rasana soy, lob mite saad. The tongue is asleep in its desire for sweet flavors. Man soya, maya bismad. So, Let's just check in on ourselves. Do we, do we engage in slander? How do we feel when we listen to gossip? You know, do we look at beauty of another? Do we get very engrossed in, in flavors? So this is, again, we know that we are the children of a Galburg. So our minds are actually, Guru Sahib says, Manatu Jyot Sarup hai, Apna Mool Pachan. So the mind is actually the same as a Kalpurk. It's Jyot Sarup, and Kalpurk is Prakash. But the mind doesn't recognize that because it's asleep, it's become intoxicated. So, what does Guru Sahib tell us that how do we awaken this mind? Anna? So, simar, simar, simar gur apna, soya man jagai. Through doing simran, chanting the Lord's name, we start to awaken our mind. How does that, so this is, this is like the key. If we take anything away from today, it's this. Um, and this is quite a difficult concept in some ways, because I guess for a long time myself, if I had been listening to this talk and we got to this point in the talk, and so I'm now, I'm like, okay, so now I know that, you know, the bunch short have been, so let's just do a little bit of summary, you know? Um, so the, this is all a, a game created by the creator, and we don't know why, but Guru, you know, Vaiguru has created this game. And as part of the game, um, the bunch jord have been placed within the human body to separate the mind from its source, to stop it from getting its true nourishment. So this is all part of the game. So when we are in growth, when we are in calm, when we are in ego, when we are in attachment, that's not the true part of ourselves, the atma, the jord. That's not truly us that's displaying that behavior or having those thoughts. That is the banj jor within us scheming to create this, keep, keep the mind asleep so that it can act out and it can bring these thoughts to the, the mind of, of the person and it can carry out these behaviors. So that's one point. Um, and I think for me, that was pretty life, I know we're supposed to be doing a summary, but I just wanted to add on to that point, which is that was pretty life changing for me because with my bunch jaw, they're very strong and they still, you know, I still struggle with them. But when I started to recognize that they were not coming from me, it's not that I wasn't taking responsibility anymore, but it's like I could finally believe in myself again, which is that I understood that this game is playing out in every single one of us, in every single body. And the bunch jaw are very strong. You know, that there is in Gurbani the, the analogy of the wrestling match. And if you read that further, the whole Shabbat, it talks about how you've got these five opponents and they're so strong. And, you know, this one mind has to wrestle these five opponents. It's not an easy feat. And all of us know if we're in the midst of anger or we're in the midst of lust or ego, it's very difficult to let go. And for, for many of us, there's a sense of guilt, isn't there? Why can't I control these things? Why are these taking over? And for the first time, when I understood that this was part of the, the game, I felt a little bit less guilt. And that guilt freed me up to actually do something productive about, about these Banjjot and deal with them. So another thing that happened is that when I would be faced with somebody who was in anger 
or in ego, what I would do before is judge them. Oh, look at him. He can't control his anger. Or I've got to stay away from him because he's so hungari. Or I've got to keep away from her because she's so attached to this, that, this, that. We start to personalize and become very judgy. <laughs> And that that in you know, when I started to read more into Gurbani, there was um, the the Gurmukhs, the, the Guru Sikhs in Gurbani were saying, "There's nobody worse than me," you know, "Ho aparadi gunegar." So that helped me to change that mat because from being very very judgmental to other people and looking at their afguns, and to recognizing that the panchjora are playing out within every single person. So now when my husband is having a, an off day, he hasn't done his simran or he's he's very tired, and he comes up to me and he's you know, shouting or getting annoyed. Now, within my mind, I've repeated this so many times to myself that I can say, this isn't my husband standing in front of me. This is his bunch jaw taking over and they are just, they are speaking on his behalf. They are speaking, they are acting out. And you know what that enables me to do? To stop, to stay silent or to walk away. Whereas before, what would happen it wouldn't take me even a second to start fighting back. And so what happens is that the bunch jawed within one person brings out the bunch jawed in another person. And what happens is it's the bunch jawed attacking each other. The people are not involved anymore. The jawed sarup, the, the true nature of who we are, are not involved. The atma doesn't fight. It doesn't engage in conflict. It's just the bunch jawed. Kabirji says, Gehat kabir panche ka chagra, chagra ta janam gavaya. And in this way, people, the Banjjur within people fight, fight, fight. And in this way, um, Janam Gavaya, the, the, the Janam is lost, the human life, the precious jewel that was this human life was lost. So I'm at the point now, if I'm listening to this presentation, where I'm like, okay, so the Banjjur are not me. They're really strong. They keep the mind intoxicated. They keep the mind trapped. And that's why you know, with the intoxication, that's why it feels so good sometimes, you know, to be annoyed and angry and, and, you know, and then you're getting to, then we get to the point of the presentation where it's like, okay, so the solution is to do Simran. So if it was the old me listening, I'd be like, well, oh, great, I'm stuffed then, because, you know, is it, is it, it can't be that simple. You know, there's got to be more to it. She doesn't know what she's talking about. You know, this isn't, this isn't going to be the way, this isn't going to be the strategy. It can't just be as simple as this. And then the old me would have said, I've done Simran, I've tried it, it doesn't work. I find it really difficult to sit. I can do it for two minutes at a time and then I want to get up. And and But as time went on, I'm just going to share a bit of my personal experience. Um, when I got married um, to my husband, his name is Harbir Singh, um, and he used to do a lot of Simran um, and he had a very good character. And although he had not been brought up in an Amritdari family, he didn't really know how to read Bard properly. He didn't really learn Santhya. So the two of us getting married was quite funny because I was full of Banjjur, but I externally looked very um, advanced in my Sikhi. So I would read and pronounce everything correctly. And I was, um, you know, so I was, very, I was very judgy towards him. But what I started to notice as I lived with him was that he, he was cool as a cucumber. He was really chilled out and he was, you know, he, he didn't display hankar. He wouldn't talk over me. He wouldn't judge me. And he used to do a lot of Simran, and I, I didn't do any, because uh, always, I'd always struggled with doing Simran. When I started doing his, uh, as we were married for longer and longer, I kind of was like, okay, well, clearly I'm not doing every, anything right. <laughs> like, I'm doing Girtan, I'm able to do Santhya, I'm able to read Gurbani way better than him, I can I know more bar, parts off by heart, you know, I'm literally, like, so advanced compared to him in my head, this was my ego speaking. But actually, I'm a complete flop when it comes to the children, I, I'm the first one to get angry. When it comes to fights, I'm the first one to start them. So something's not quite right. And, you know, reluctantly, he, um, I went along with him to a Simran camp. I don't know how he persuaded me to do this. And, um, and I was forced, I say, although I'm sure it was optional, could have got up, to sit through a two-hour Simran session, right? So it was, it was a very strange experience. For the first hour and a half, I was just bombarded by thoughts. And now I know that the thoughts come from the Banjjur. Those thoughts don't come from the Atma. They don't come from the Jod Sarup, that part of us. They come from the Banjjur. And that is the way that the Banjjur keep us trapped and, and under their rule. 
So I was having all these thoughts as come all these thoughts coming up and I would try and settle the mind and the Gurmukh who was leading the sermon would say, you know, you've got to listen to the sound of your voice. So I would try to listen, I would be saying, Why Guru? Why Guru? Why Guru? And I would really try to listen to the sound. And then the Gurmukh would say a little while later, Sravani Sunya. Rasana gaya, hirda tiya soi. So, Sravani Sunya, listen with your ears, chant with your tongue, then you will be able to enshrine within your heart. So, all of these things to motivate us, keep us going. And so, after a little while, I would start listening again to the sound, chanting with the tongue, listening, and then my mind would go into thoughts again. For about an hour and a half, I, I felt like I was losing completely. If, if the mind is the wrestler and the bunch draw are the opponents, I was getting completely battered. And then something happened. About 15 minutes towards the end, my mind started to settle. So I started to listen to the sound. Why, Guru? Why, Guru? Why, Guru? Why, Guru? And the mind started to listen. It was actually listening. It was actually becoming present. And in that moment, you know, I had the most incredible experience of bliss and peace. Never experienced anything like it. And there will be some of you listening who've also done Simran and experienced that peace. And it was from that point onwards that I thought, okay, there's definitely something in this, this Simran. And so five, six years fast forward, Simran and the practice of Simran has become an essential part of my daily routine. If I don't do my Simran in the morning and in the evening, and I try to do it in the day as well, I am, let's just say, I'm not a very pleasant person <laughs> to be around. Um, and so what happens is that as the mind does Simran and it starts to listen to the sound of the mantra, it starts to listen, it starts to listen. In Gurbani it tells us, and you have this experience, the more you do Simran, your mind starts to reside within its nijgar. Nijgar mehel pavo sukhsehji, which is where you experience the peace. And in the Nijgar, your punch door can't touch you. You don't have thoughts anymore. You're in a thoughtless state, a completely thoughtless state. Imagine what it would be like to not have any thoughts. So, but you're still awake. So there's a lot of bliss, but it takes time, it takes effort, it takes work. And then what happens is, and from a science perspective and a psychology perspective, we know that when, when people meditate, so there's been lots of research studies on this, when people bring their attention to a single point and stop the mind from escaping through the nine doors of the body and stop the mind going into thoughts all the time constantly, the mind starts to settle. And when the mind starts to settle, it, that produces profound effects in our mind and in our body, in our brains and within the physical body itself, a healing effect within the body. And so when I started to learn all about the science and everything, then, then it all just started to come together, that I knew that Simran had to be a part of my life. And when I was doing that practice and when I do that practice, my banj jord are a lot less fierce well, let's just say, so what Gurbani says, when we do Simran, and the mind resides in the Nijkar, it starts to, in the Nijkar, Dasam Dwar, Begum Purashar, lots of names um, for, for that place um, that we have within the body that the mind can go to once it's, once it's, um, once we do Simran and we cleanse the mal of thoughts, then the Banshra don't affect us as much. And also we can remain conscious throughout the day. So let's say I wake up in the morning, I do my Simran, I awaken my mind. As I go throughout the day, I will start to be able to spot when those bunch jaw are starting to take control again. So let's say I go downstairs and my children are resisting having breakfast or they're getting frustrated about putting their clothes on. If I've done Simran and I'm keeping conscious then I'll be able to start to recognize, okay, there's a bit of irritation within me right now. I need to settle myself. And so that becomes a habit. 
And so then you're able to just be so much more aware when you're moving through your through your day. Gurbani Gurbani says, Pancha Paherwa Dharma Rahte Enaka Nahi Patiara Jet Sochet. I'm gonna I can't remember, sorry, let me just get the Gurbani pick up for yourself so I can read it. Um it, it just explains that here it is. Pancha Paherwa Dharma Rahte Tinaka Nahi Patiare Chet Sochet Chit Hoy Raho ujara. So the suchet, remaining suchet, allows you to prevent those panjjor from taking over and putting the mind to sleep again and again. So I've been speaking for quite a long time, didn't expect to do such a long presentation. Um, so I'm gonna gonna stop sharing at the end of the presentation. Um, and I guess at this point. It will probably be helpful to open up the floor to any questions or any comments. Um, so let me know. Unmute your mics so, if you want to. So there have been three questions submitted through the anonymous um, question box. So I'm just going to ask you the first one. Akal yeah. Purakh is Akal Murat in brackets timeless. So how can he exist without creating the world, then suddenly decide to create the world? If he's timeless, wouldn't he wouldn't he be always creating? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um and so I don't I'm not the authority on these questions. So I'm just gonna give you an answer based on my very limited knowledge. Um but but Guru, Guru, um, Guru Sahib in Gurbani tells us that Vaiguru is always here around us and within us and, and never is, is never never born and never dies. So it's not as if Vaiguru created the game and then kind of, you know, that was it. The game is just the game. But Vaiguru is ever present and is giving us breaths. Um, Guru says, uh, there's a Gurbani tuk. Ape karta kar kar veke denda saas giraha hai. So the timeless being is giving us every single breath that we are breathing right now is being given by a Kalpurk Vaiguru. And they are ever present. Hazar Hazur Khudai. So and we can tap into a Kalpurk because they are ever present. If we can settle the mind, take the mind into the Nijgar and stay there, reside there, that's Vaiguru's door. And as we stay, as we stay, as we stay, as the mind settles within within the Nijgar, then Vaiguru in Gurbani explains that um, we're at Vaiguru's door there. And then it's Vaiguru's Marji, whether they open that door and they give us Nam Tan. I don't know if that's answered your question, but it's, it is complicated. And, you know, I don't know half of most of the answers to, to these kind of questions about Akal Burk and creation. And I guess we'll only know when we experience the card book. That was really well answered. Thank you for that. Um, the second question that was submitted is, how can we start breaking bad habits and how do we find the motivation to do tasks like school, work and exercise, etc.? Yeah, that's a really good question. So habits are, are really, um, can be really difficult to break. Because what happens is that when we do something over and over again, or even think something or feel something over and over again, it becomes embedded within us. Um, and we have the conscious mind and we've got the subconscious mind as well. And when we do something over and over again, it gets handed over to the subconscious mind and the subconscious mind carries things out automatically. So we don't have to think about them anymore in the same way that we can brush our teeth and drive a car and do tasks that we've done so many times without thinking, because that's, that's good, isn't it? If, if you don't have to exert, you know, if, imagine if you had to think every single time you needed to brush your teeth, think about how to brush, how to put the toothpaste on, all of that, you know, everything would be very effortful. So the subconscious mind's role is to take over those tasks that you do enough times for them to need to become automatic. So in the same way, bad habits get taken over by you know, get um, the subconscious mind takes those bad habits and allows us to continue doing them very easily without us having to think. And what we know is that the subconscious mind is 
thousand times more powerful than the conscious mind. So when it comes to breaking a habit, you can think as much as you want and desire to change that habit as much as you want with your conscious mind. But it's almost as if that habit is already on a program, on a computer program that just turns on automatically because it's something you do all the time. So that's why, you know, um, you can read as many self-help books as you want and, you know, and have the intention to, to change. And that it's so difficult to change because what you need to change is your subconscious mind. So the, the method that we often use to try and change habits is not effective because it's only targeting the conscious mind. So this is all quite complicated, but if you want to know more, there's a guy called Joe Dispenza who talks about this in a lot of detail. And lots of people talk about the conscious and subconscious mind. So have a look. It's really interesting. And it also relates to Sikhi in terms of I believe that the, the bunch jaw exists within that subconscious state of mind. Um, so when you, if you want to change a habit, you've got to repeat that new habit enough times for it to become the preferred option that the mind and body takes, the preferred route. So it's, it's all about repetition. And the other thing is that meditation is, is one of the only things that's known to actually go into, uh, allow you access into the subconscious mind to change habits. So if you've got a habit you wanna change, if you do meditation alongside repeating the new habit as many times and as often as you can, then you're onto a winning, you know, you're, you're basically, you're, you're very likely to change that habit. Um, and so, you know, you're talking about struggling with motivation and all of that. It's tough when you're, when you're already used to doing something like procrastinating <laughs> or not studying. It's really hard to bring muster up the kind of strength to to kind of you know create a new habit and do something. Um, so yeah, I think our, meditation is for me the remedy for everything, panacea for everything. Procrastination, anxiety, depression, bad habits. If you introduce five or ten minutes of meditation in the morning or in the evening or whenever you will start to see a change within seven days um, on, on lots of different, different elements of your life. The challenge is actually implementing meditation. So with my clients in private practice, all of the clients that have a meditation practice by the time we finished working together, they don't contact me again for sessions. Whereas all of those clients that have finished working with me and have not got uh, embedded a meditation practice within their daily routine, they guaranteed always come back to me and call me and say, I'm struggling with this now, I'm struggling with that now. So I would really recommend everybody try and introduce some meditation. And it's hard and it's challenging at first, but as soon as when you start to see the benefits, it's something you can never let go of. On that note, good. there is a request to finish off the session with uh, five minutes of Simran. But before that, we do have a few more questions. Um, so why does Akal Purkh keep creating Maya when it would ultimately lead to Duk? So I wish like, Akal Purkh would come on the line right now and answer these questions. <laughs> um, Vaigru is listening to us. Anna. But um, I don't know. The answer is, I don't know what what the vijar was that Vaiguru had to create this this game um, and to separate. And then, because ultimately, once this game is over, we'll we'll join back to Galpurk anyway, and we will, you know, we will all be one again. So, um, so I, I guess. Um, in Gurbani, from my reading of Gurbani, my understanding is that, um, you know, it's the ones that, that love Vaigru enough and, and can come out of Maya and, and um, you know, detach from, detach from the Maya, the, the world, and, and see it, rise above it almost, and want to have this desire to, to actually connect with with Agarburg, they are the ones that will meet Vaigru. Um, and so I've heard people say, and I don't know whether this is true, that, you know, it's it's about seeing how much Pyar 
um, PR you have for Kalpurk. But again, you know, we we can ask these questions directly when we when we actually talk to Kalpurk. And, and in Gurbani it says, um, uh, what is the Shabbat? I can't remember, but it talks about um, the Saj Gufa. When we go, when our mind goes into Saj, then we can actually have do galbath. The bhagats can do galbath with the galpurk themselves and ask any questions that they have. Bhagata sang sant sub um ghost gat. Ghost is like galbath. So bhagat the bhagats can do ghost ghosty legs um with with a galpurk. So let's aim to do that and then I can ask you these questions. <laughs> Thank you. Um Fourth question that we have is how can you wield the punch jaws? How can you beat them? Um, yeah, so the only way that I know from a Galpurk is from from Gurbani, sorry, is to awaken the mind. Because um, that is because the punch jaw were meant to be able to assist us in our day to day. You know, we, we need, we can use them to our benefit. But it's only because the mind is asleep that they just do whatever they want. You know, they they wreak havoc over our body kingdoms and create conflict in our lives. So the only thing that we can do is w awaken our mind through doing Simran. And when the mind is awake, then it has full awareness and can can be in charge of how to use the Banjjur in order to have a comfortable and happy life. Because Sikhi is, is not about having a miserable life, you know. It's about once that connection is made with the Galpurk and once we experience Naam, uh, the Naam that resides in the body, then we can have a very blissful life here and enjoy the experience of being alive. Um, so, and, and we can use the Banj Jor to aid that enjoyment. Thank you for the question. Amazing. Um, last question. Uh, should you try to help other people who are dealing with the bunch chores and aren't aware of it? Y yes. Um, definitely. Like, if you find that you are becoming more and more aware of your bunch chores, and you can see how they're creating conflict in your life and how they're creating struggles and dukk, then it's absolutely our responsibility to share that with other people as Sikhs. Gursat Gurga Jo Sikh Akai Sopalki Ur Tarnam Pyabe. And then at the end it's Apajabe Avranam Jabave. So, you know, it's it's important for us to to share what we know and to help others in the same way that we've been helped through Gurbani, definitely. The only caveat to that is that um, sometimes we can get into this situation <laughs> where we think we're helping somebody. So let's say my husband comes up to me and he's really angry. If I go to him, it's your punch jaw making you angry. <laughs> and, and it's my punch jaw saying that, you know, that's probably not going to help the situation. Um, so if you're saying it to Sanai to somebody, as in like, you know, you're in the wrong and blah, that's, that's not coming from a place of, Kind of our Atma speaking. That's probably our bunch or you know, really confusing us and trying to make us use what we know on a from a Sikhi point of view to to annoy the other person. So it's just about being careful about what your intention is. That's all. Thank you. Um, next question. We got more. Um, how long do you normally do Simran for, and do and do you find bliss virtually every time? Uh, I ask because I have done Simran for fifteen to thirty minutes, hundreds of times, and only a handful of times have I felt any sort of bliss. Yeah, yeah. So um, it depends on a lot of things. So some people, some people's mind gets attached to the Gurmantar, the Shabbat, really, really quickly. And as soon as the mind gets attached, then there are, there are so, when, when it's when the thoughts reduce. So when the mind becomes attached very easily, the thoughts reduce, and then there's bliss. But what happens with most of us is that it takes quite a long time 
for the mind to actually listen to the sound of the mantra from the Guru Mantra. So you will be trying and we listen, but really the mind will be in thoughts. And if the mind is in thoughts, then there's no bliss there. There's no peace in thoughts. So we have to come above thoughts. Vichar mare. We have to kill the thoughts. Guru Bani says, Vichar mare tare tare ulta junna ave. It's when the thoughts are killed, when the thoughts start to reduce, that we start to experience the bliss. And I, I have to do a lot of Simran, you know. Um, so I, I try to do two hours in the morning. So I know this sounds extreme, but you know, I've, I've, I get, I'm at the point in my life where I really I believe what, what Gurbani says, and I didn't for a long time. And I really want to, I really want to meet my true father and mother. I really want to meet a God Waigu. And so it takes me two hours in the morning to settle my mind. And sometimes I don't experience you know, the the kind of, you know, some days I'll be like, wow, I feel so incredible. Like my whole body feels like light as a feather and I feel so good. And I just feel, and some days it's harder, especially when I've been very busy during the day or I've been having a lot of thoughts about a situation. That's when it's harder for the mind to settle. And that's why it's really important. It's not enough, sorry, to just do meditation in the morning or in the evening. You get to a point where you have to start doing meditation with your eyes open. So being conscious of your thoughts during the day. It's not, our, our instruction isn't just to do it sitting down at one or two points in the day. It's about being in a meditative state all the way through the day. And, you know, for me, somebody like me, anybody who knows me personally can uh, vouch for this. But, you know, I'm not, I've not been a very good person. My character was very poor. And like, if somebody like me, and I've never used to like Simran, doing Simran. So if somebody like me can do a lot of Simran now and, and be starting to meditate with, with my eyes open during the day, anybody can do it. So I think if you really want to, if you, it just depends on how much you want this. How much do you want the peace? How much do you want to merge back into a Gargurk? And, you know, when the desire becomes stronger, then the Simran will increase as well. Um, I do a Thursday evening zoo guided Simran session, 8.30 to 9.30. There's about five or six of us. So please join us. I'll send the Zoom link if anyone's interested. It's free, obviously, and it's um, uh, videos off and mics muted. But it really helps to do Simran um, alongside other people as well. And it's guided. So it's, you know, I'm always checking in. Is the mind still listening or has the mind gone into thoughts, you know? So, um yeah, and then so I do the two morning, two hours in the morning, and then I do an hour in the evening as well. Uh, so I try and do similar on going to sleep. Um, yeah. Thank you for yeah. the question. I definitely think our Sangat would appreciate that link. Um, last question that we have here is how can we help someone who's dealing with grief after the passing of a loved one? So it's t really really tough losing somebody that you love um, and it takes time to process it and to come to terms with it and to figure out how how you're going to move forward knowing that that person is no longer in your life um, so I think that the best thing that somebody can do is to just be there as a supportive, to be able to have a supportive space ready for when that person is ready to talk. So I'm speaking from my personal experience when my husband lost his brother a few years ago. It's probably been about five, six years now. And I, I did all the wrong things <laughs> with, with trying to support my husband, even though I'm a psychologist. Um, it's always the case of you kind of do it better when it's not your own, you know? Um, and so, you know, I learned through that process to just that I need to back off and give him time. Um, but I need to show interest and show that I'm, I'm there to support him should he need it. But, you know, when somebody is going through something like that, it can be an incredibly transformative experience as well, just like with any kind of duk, any kind of pain. Hana Guru Sahib says, duk daru sukrok daya. So when somebody's going through something, it often forces them to reevaluate their lives 
And so them being in a period of duk and kind of a low mood and confusion and, you know, all of that is not necessarily a bad thing. It's not something you need to rescue them from. Obviously, you want to be there as a support. But we all know that it's at our deepest, darkest moments that we turn to God and that we start to delve more into our faith and our sikhi. So I, I would say, yeah, you, you don't need to rescue anybody from, from that, but be there as a supportive person should they need, should they need you. Thank you for that. Um, well, that pretty much sums up all the questions the Sangat had. And um, if you're willing to, um, we would love if you could end off this session with five minutes of Simran. Thank you. I would, that would be uh, an honor. Um, it's my favorite thing to do. So that'd be brilliant. So yeah, let's, let's um, just, sorry, just before we do, I just want to say uh, thank you for this opportunity. And it's been a pleasure to, to speak with all of you. And, and thank you for your questions. And also to say that, um, you know, please forgive any mistakes that I've made in reciting Gurbani or answering questions. Um, you know, I, 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 there's, I've got a long way to go in terms of learning. Um, and so, yeah, thank you. So let's begin the Simran. So what I'd like everybody to do, if they can, is to just get, sit in a comfortable position. So relax the body. And just start to notice the flow of breath that's traveling through them. So as you breathe in, noticing the breath flowing into the body. And as you breathe out, noticing the breath flowing out. And just bring your attention to that process of breathing. Because how precious is this breath that Guru Sahib is giving to us, placing within our mouth. Be karta, kar kar dekhe, denda saas giraha hai. So let us tune into that breath, that giver of life, that is keeping us here alive, nourishing us, tuning into that flow of breath. And what you will notice is that your, your mind will maybe start to go into thoughts, judging this experience or about what you need to do after this session or something that's happened earlier in the day. And what I want you to gently do now that we know that it's the Banj Jod bringing the thoughts, not allowing us to connect and bring our surti inside our body, we want to gently just samjar our mind that these thoughts are coming from the bunge and just gently bring your attention back to that flow of breath. Noticing the way the breath feels as it flows through you and bringing your mind back whenever the mind strays into thoughts. And we're just going to do some Simran today. Saas Giras Simran as prescribed in Gurbani. Jo Saas Giras Teaye Mera Har Har So Gur Sikh Guru Man Paave. So Saas is the breath that comes in and Giras is the breath that comes out when we breathe. And we're going to use the techniques given in, in Gurbani again and attach our mind to the sound of the Shabad, the Gurmantar being recited. Tuna mehatyan, tuna is sound, tyan is attention. Tuna mehatyan, tyan mehajanya, gurmuk akat kahani. So we're going to recite the mantar. Please do join me. And we're going to say vahe with the in breath. And we're going to listen to the vahe being said by ourselves. And then we're going to say guru. And then we're going to listen to the guru. And in this way, we're going to attach our surti to the Gurmantar. Why, Guru? Why, Guru? Why, 
गुरु वार 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 गुरु continuing to chant and listening tuning the mind to the sound of the shabad why guru 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 why continuing to chant internally keeping the mind present Noticing how peaceful and blissful it feels when the mind can listen to the mantra. And knowing that when the mind becomes free of vichar, then the connection with the Garbhurg opens up. And that's when, when we do Bhenti to Garpurk, that Vaiguru hears us and listens. That connection is stronger, the signal is clearer, because our mind is not in Bichar. And what Bhenti can we do? Raak Pita Prabhmeri, save me, my father, my Pita. Mohe Niraguna Sabaguna Tere. I have no gun, 
ਕੋਲ ਗੁਣ ਆਇਓਸ ਪੰਜ ਬਿਖਾਦੀ ਏਕ ਗਰੀਬਾ ਦਸ ਫਾਈਵ ਵਿਸ਼ਸ ਥੀਵਸ ਦਸ ਪੰਜ ਚੋਰ ਦਸ ਫਾਈਵ ਆਫ ਥੋਸ ਐਂਡ ਓਨਲੀ ਵਨ ਆਫ ਮੀ ਪੰਜ ਬਿਖਾਦੀ ਏਕ ਗਰੀਬਾ ਰਾਖੋ ਰਖਨ ਹਾਰੇ only you can save me khed kare ar bahut santave they torment me they torture me so much ayo sharan tuhare and i have come to your sharan and it's when we do simran and we try to kill our vichar that's when we enter into the sharan of the satguru that's within us So this is our benti and let's just take a minute to do this benti to god purk within within us that because it is only with with their grace their kirpa that we can defeat these panchjor So let us do benti that we continue to walk on this path and seek the guidance of guruji so that we may fulfill the purpose of our life and experience eternal peace <laughs>